Um, so as Andrew mentioned, I'm Robert Heen. Uh, my wife kind of asked me, why do you put your own picture up on that? Because when I'm online, I show up right here live. I don't know, I'm just used to putting my photo on the Who Am I page. Uh, my whole career has been in some flavor of IT. I started as the uh, IT service desk technician at my university, which, you know, the IT grunt, go get all the laptops and move them around, go pick up the hardware. And I learned a lot by doing. And that's kind of been a through line in my experience in tech. And I'll talk more about that in relation to Confluence as we go. Uh, since then, I've served different roles in different areas of IT. Um, started working on projects very early in my career, got into the HR tech side of things which tends to be where I find myself now. So I'm a systems manager working with an HR tech company uh, and been using Confluence eight or nine years. <clears throat> um, and again, mostly because I had to. I showed up at my job one day and they said, that's the knowledge base. And that was the training. Just there's a Confluence logo, click it, and there's a knowledge base and the person kind of walked away. And I had to kind of figure out by doing. I joke, I beat my head into the keyboard and that's how I figure things out, which will get us there. The brute force method will help us figure things out on a technical level, but it can be very painful, as I'm sure many of you maybe have experienced, if not with Confluence, with other things. Um, in the bottom left is my contact info. I'll leave this up at the end. Feel free to email me if you have questions or follow-ups. I've got a blog I post to, as well as a YouTube channel with all the content. And again, this will show up at the end of the lecture, so no worries if you miss it right now. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about my story. I also do a lot of online training right now, and I can talk about that at the end but I'm really interested in the gap we see a lot between your average user and your system admins or folks who really know what's going on. And that's the purpose of this training. This Confluence Basics is for the folks like past Rob, who when they started using Confluence, didn't know what a space was, didn't know how to make a page, didn't know how to edit, couldn't use a template. And so really trying to solve that challenge where we show up for our work and we don't know how to use the tools to do our job. No one's job is to use Confluence, it's to write code. It's to help other people recruit. It's to invent new things. Um, so this is interactive, as Andrew mentioned. I am happy to just keep talking for the full hour, and then we'll have a break and talk for another hour. Um, but I expect that you all will have questions. Please raise your hand. We've got mics. We'll pass them around. We have a pretty small group, which I was telling some of you earlier is an advantage, because you can be a little bit more selfish than you could be in a group of 50, 60 people. We can dig into very specific things. Now, please don't share confidential information or anything sensitive. Make it generic, and I can talk you through in a generic instance or try and answer your question. But if you have something specific to your use case, I'm more than happy to chat with it for a bit. Depending on the question, I might need to defer it, and I can get back to you later or catch you in between the sessions, depending on how big the question is. From time to time, the slide we're looking at here is for the online where people are in chat and they type in like a one, two, three, four, or five. I might ask you how comfortable are you with a topic or a thing. If you're not comfortable, don't raise your hand. If you're comfortable, I'm trying to find a good way to do this, raise your hand in a fist. And if you're super comfortable, do like a five. And that just shows me kind of over the group who's comfortable with a thing and who isn't. I've had people in my trainings just type in the chat, I'm a total noob. And that's awesome. That's exactly why we do these. I've had people in the training say I'm a five. That's awesome too, because then you can help other folks or I might, you know, if I need help, you could probably raise your hand and help explain something if you know more than I do. And that's a super important thing. Like I learned all this by doing and by talking to folks and figuring it out. I don't know everything. No one does. So that's why I rely on folks. And I will talk about other resources at the end of this that we have. So a quick agenda. Um, I'm going to talk about some concepts and this is the, you know, Rob has PowerPoint slides and points at them. And the intention here is to make sure we all have a kind of foundational knowledge of terminology or things in Confluence. Again, if you don't know what a space is, it's very hard to have a discussion around access. If you're unfamiliar about the difference between a page and a blog, it's gonna confuse you when you go in and you can't find templates on a blog. So we'll cover some of these concepts, and then I'm gonna get hands-on. I have a Confluence demo box, and if you don't have Confluence at work or can't use it to play around with, you can go get a free instance, a free copy of Confluence to play with. I highly recommend folks do that just so you can go in and tinker. The free one has a couple of restrictions. You can't do things like access control, but you don't really need that with only one person. So you can do most of the things I'm gonna show you in that free instance, or if you have it at work, go into some safe place at work to go tinker around and go add pages, restrict them, play with templates. Um, quick show of hands, who uses Confluence at work currently? Awesome, all right. Andrew, thank you for raising your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to say thank you to Andrew and Atlassian for hosting this. Again, I'm doing this because they are looking for folks to help out, and Andrew's been a huge help in making that happen. 
Okay, so a quick show of comfort. Um, how comfortable are we with Confluence? Don't raise your hand if you have no idea what it is. Put a five up if you're super comfortable or a fist if you're kind of in the middle. Okay, uh, anyone wanna just kind of shout out what they think Confluence is? A collaborative tool. Okay, anyone else? Any other ideas or thoughts? And I'm not gonna say like, that's wrong and that's a terrible answer because Confluence is many things. Any other ideas? All right. Well, definitely a collaboration platform, uh, you know, a tool where we go to share things. But we can also think of it more of like a restricted knowledge base. I've worked in environments where I can go in and look up content, but I can't change it, even if it's wrong, even if I have to update it. I have to go find the person or team who controls it. So we have Confluence could be a little bit more restrictive, but accessible to many people. Confluence could be only accessible to folks who work at my company. It's internal. And it could be super restricted in terms of access or super open. It could also be exposed to folks outside of my company. Imagine I have help desk articles or product updates. Um, it could be, again, widely accessed, narrowly accessed, closed, open, customer facing, internal, et cetera. So there's many ways to use it. And one of the things I think of when people ask me, how should I use Confluence? How do I get adoption is what is the use case? Am I using it to help my HR team onboard workers? Because that's a lot different than helping my product team and keep track of their projects is a lot different than helping train my customers on how to use the product. Many times we go into Confluence and we don't have a clear understanding of what we're using it for, and that ends up with a blurry picture of how it should be used, which can result in other things like can't finding content or folks don't know where to put things. So there's a lot of different ways to use it. When you get back, or maybe you have a thought right now, ask yourself, how am I using it? How is my team using it? And how is my company using it? Because those three different things will change how we interact with or how we approach what we want to do with it. Okay, spaces in the context of Confluence. I originally had a Spaceman logo here, and Andrew's like, yeah, that's cute, but that doesn't help explain what spaces are. <laughs> um, so quick show of hands again. Don't put a hand up if you don't know what a space is. Give me a five if you're super comfortable, or a fist if you're kind of in the middle. A fist, a fist, a couple down, a five. Kurt, do you want to explain what a space is? I like that. A collection of things that are joined together like a workspace. Yeah, it's, I use uh, the analogy of a library a lot when I think of Confluence. My copy of Confluence is the library, and then spaces are how I organize the stuff within it. In the library, there's a section for biology, it's over there, and there's a kids section and periodicals, and you know generally what is in those areas or what should be in those areas. <laughs> in Confluence, it's just a way to sectionalize and collect related types of things. Now we'll talk a little bit about more of this in the next, next class on space administration, but typically we see these broken up by team. Human resources or my people team will have a space that human resources or people gets to manage and fill with content. And everyone knows human resource stuff is in there. My engineering team may have one space for each project. So they know that project X information lives in there. Now spaces give us some ability to control access. So again, in that engineering example, maybe no one can see it except those engineers. In the HR example, maybe everyone can see it, but only certain folks in HR have access to edit it. Now, there's also this concept of a personal space. Is anyone familiar with that? A couple nods. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. Um, a, a personal space is one that your administrator can just give everyone in the company. If you have one of these, that's a great place to go tinker around and play with setups because you're your own space administrator. You control that access. You can do whatever you want. I use my personal space at work to do things like my own meeting notes, my own one-on-one -on -one documentation. I keep track of all the stuff that's important to Rob, and I also use it like as a staging ground. I'm preparing some documentation, it's not ready to go live, but I'll flesh it out and maybe work with some folks on it, and then I'll push it out to where it should go. So again, in this context, this space is just a collection of hopefully related stuff. Okay, pages and blogs. Again, don't put your hand up if you have no clue what these are, if you're super comfortable with five and a fist is somewhere in the middle, how are y'all feeling about pages versus blogs? Okay, Andrew gave me a three. <laughs> um, I, I'm kind of joking about that. When I do this online, I say give me a one, two, three, four, or five, and people will say like 0.3, 4.75. I'm like, okay, we're splitting hairs. <laughs> Just a general sense. I didn't know there was a difference at first. 
I didn't know a blog existed in Confluence. I saw it in the sidebar, and I'll show you that when we go hands-on, but I didn't understand the difference. Now, both of them share a lot of similarities. Our rich content editing, things like macros, you can share them, you can link to them, you can restrict them. Where they start to get different is where they appear. And again, this screenshot's kind of tiny on this gigantic screen, oddly enough, but pages show up on the left side of my content tree. I can organize them in a parent-child relationship. So I think of the HR, the people example. I might have a page called policies, and under that, if I expand it, all of the policies that I have. In my engineering spaces, I might have a page called documentation, and under that, a subpage called API documentation, and then under that, all of the API stuff. So pages let us structure our content hierarchically, which I think is a real word. If not, I just made it one. But it helps improve browsing. Someone goes in and they just know, oh, under policies are my policies. Under API documentation is my API documentation. They also allow templates, which is something we'll touch on here tomorrow morning if y'all are available between 8 and 9 AM. <laughs> or if you want to watch the recording, I'm doing a one hour deep dive into just templates. So I'll touch on them here, but I'll get really in depth tomorrow. And again, I'll show you where those recordings will live later. Um, but you can't really organize pages chronologically. They will have something like a created or updated date, but visually they show up in that hierarchy. They won't show up when they were published necessarily. Uh, for me, they're well suited for perennial information, stuff that doesn't really change, or stuff that might change over time, or for stuff that folks go to frequently. Blogs, on the other hand, don't have templates. This personally drives me nuts. Andrew, who do I talk to about that? He's getting pizza. Um, I tend to copy and paste one blog into the next one because I like the format, but templates don't exist in blogs. They're intended more for point in time. So because I have a live audience, any thoughts on what would be a good example of a point in time information? Something like a product update. Every week I put out a blog post explaining the updates to my HR system. Something like, what did the team do this week? Something like my accomplishments. So I think of blogs as things that, oh, it's published on March 3rd. That's never gonna change, it happened. So blogs are displayed chronologically and we'll see this when we get into the system, but it's a great way to share information that's just point in time and then move on. Blogs can also be turned off in a space. So a space admin can disable blogs if you don't use them. And that's one thing I'll talk to a lot more on the space admin side of the house, but customizing our Confluence instance by removing things we don't need or use is a really important step because it gets rid of the clutter. Again, when I first started using Confluence, blog was sitting there staring me in the face and no one in the company used it. Why was it there? No one thought, no one thought to turn it off, but it just took up space, made the system a tiny bit harder to use. Okay, my favorite topic, I'm sure you're all experts, um, access. So again, a five fingers, you know everything, a fist, you're kind of in the middle and nothing, it's brand new, you're confused. Okay, Kurt, all five, all right. <laughs> I'm just chuckling, usually with access, this is to me the most confusing bit of Confluence. This took a lot of time, I joke, bashing my head into the keyboard. There are three basic levels. So a Confluence instance is your copy of Confluence. My company has one, Atlassian has a separate copy. It's possible for a company to have multiple copies, but those instances are separate. It's like two separate systems entirely that don't necessarily talk to each other. So if you don't have access to the instance, you can't see anything in it. I don't have access to Atlassian's instance, so it's invisible. There are some exceptions like anonymous or guest access that allows you to share information with anyone or with guests. But we wanna be careful with this because if we accidentally make it too broad and share pages or information that maybe the general public shouldn't get, that can be a very bad thing and that's a very VB capitalized. Next, we have space level access. Every space has some type of access. I'll briefly touch on it in this first course and then in the space admin, we'll dig in a lot more. But if you don't have access to a space, it doesn't exist. I'm sure some of us have gotten a link to a Confluence page and it just says, Either this page doesn't exist or you don't have access. So Confluence doesn't even confirm the thing is there. It just kind of shrugs at you and says, I don't know. This is the most confusing part for a lot of folks. Why can't I get to my content? Hey, I can see it. Why can't I edit it? I, can't, I can edit it. Why can't I comment? I can't look at the attachments. I can't delete it. And a lot of it boils down to the space level access. Now under that, individual pieces of content, my pages and blogs can be restricted. And this is where I tend to be very nitpicky with terminology. Pages are restricted, spaces have access. <laughs> yep, 
usually we just refer to access, but when I think of it separately like that, there's a page and then space layer that helps me figure out where is the problem. And again, I'll show you some examples of one, how to diagnose this, but two, what it looks like when you create a page that you might have accidentally locked out half of your company. I neglected to mention some folks joined in the middle there. Please jump in with your questions. I'll have a dedicated time towards the end of this, but please don't wait. It's you know, we have a pretty good group, but it's not too big, so I'm happy to pause in the middle as we go. Uh, templates, okay. Leave your hand down if you are very confused by these. Give me a five if you're super comfortable or just a fist if you're kind of like in the middle. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> that's okay. That's exactly why we're here, the oh, I'm not sure about that thing. Again, my experience with Confluence was learned by doing. Painful, but I figured it out. Uh, Confl Confluence templates are just pre-built structures to fit things in. Confluence comes preloaded with like 130 of these. I found some documentation actually in Confluence. So Andrew, maybe another bit of feedback that says, uh, you know, they give you over 30. Like, well, it's like 130 now. So they just keep adding more. Personally, I don't find many of them useful, but they don't fit my particular use case. But they do speed up our ability to create content because if I want to go make a policy page and there's a template that lists out all the sections I need or includes all the macros to make it show up in the right spot magically or whatever, I, it's less thought for me. I can get to creating and I don't have to fight with the system to make it look the way I want. They're also very useful for users. If I'm a user and I go to a documentation page for some complex engineering thing and it's always the same structure, I know where to go to look for common errors or where to go to how to solve it. It speeds up my ability to use the system and reduces a little bit of that friction we all have trying to get the thing we need. Templates are unique by space. So your Confluence instance comes preceded with those 130-ish templates, but every space can make their own templates. This is another point of friction. Why is a template in this page, but not on that page? You can actually search cross space and I'll show you how to do that. But I do encourage users to think through what templates will you find useful? And then if you can build them as a space admin, build them. Or if you need some help, find your space admin, maybe someone in IT or someone on your team to help you create them. Because it will help speed up your ability to make content and make Confluence easier to use. OK, Confluence collaboration. This word came up during what is Confluence. But again, quick show of hands, a five, you're really comfortable collaborating. A fist, you're kind of in the middle and a hand down. It, it's kind of terrifying. Awesome. Andrew, thank you for the five. That's good to hear. <laughs> I'm joking because he works for Alassian, so hopefully he's <laughs> a little bit more versed than I am. Um, many ways to collaborate. You can comment, you can at mention, and you can actually at mention, I think, on like three different things. Individual words on a page, entire blocks of text or a section, and the entire page. I do this a lot and it drives other people crazy because I'll highlight like two or three words and say, I don't think this is accurate. I think it should be this. Hey, I think you misspelled a word. Hey, shouldn't it be this? And then they'll get a notification and they can go fix the thing. The one place this drives me nuts is when I go to a page and I go to the bottom and there's like 27 comments and there's no resolution. So it's one thing that we as Confluence users should keep an eye on as we put comments. You know, if someone mentions you, please follow up. Or if you see a page with a lot of open comments, see if you can help figure out the answer or get rid of those. There is also collaborative editing. So if I'm editing a page and someone has access to it, I can give them the edit link and we can work on it together. So typically when I do this course, I give it to myself and two Robs are working on the page at once, but you can have up to 10 people all typing together. If you're familiar with Google Documents and you'll see like the cursor and the name, it looks like that. And I imagine other systems like Microsoft 365 have a similar way of collaborating. Can you all hear me? Oh, there we go. Um, you can also share content. I'm really lazy. I just copy the hyperlink and I give it to someone. Sometimes that bites me in the butt because if there's access restrictions, I won't know immediately and they'll just respond with, can you share? There is also a big blue share button that I'll talk about. The big difference is that will email the person and you can include uh, a little comment about why they should have it. And you can even include groups. So if your, space, if your Confluence administrator has set up groups, say a group called All of Engineering, you can send one page to an entire group of individuals instead of having to type in every single name. Ah, all right, that is the end of my wonderful slideshow. Would you like some more slides or should we jump into the confluence? Please tell me that second one. I don't have any more slides. All right, this is, yep, this is confluence. Uh, let me zoom in a bit. Even though we have these giant monitors, it still seems a little bit small. 
Does that look okay to everyone? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> this is the home page. This is some page that I almost never use in my actual job because I'm comfortable enough digging into a certain space or I have pages bookmarked and I go straight to them. But this is somewhere I can always get by up in the top left, there's this big Confluence logo. I can just click on that and that brings me right back here. There's also this home button. If I push that, I come right back here. So for a lot of new users, they end up on some page somewhere in Confluence and they don't know where they are. This is a great way to get them back to home, someplace that's a little bit safer. Now, the neat thing about this page is it kind of keeps track of like where you've been. Um, I am really bad about making a page, like not publishing it, and then I have 10 drafts floating around all called untitled. Uh, I use this feature and another one I'll show you in a bit, quite a bit to go track down those drafts I have floating around. Or if I was on a page that I thought was really interesting and I forget the name, I don't have the link, Confluence is gonna remember where I've been. So that's a very useful thing because I'll go to a page and forget and it's gonna help me find my way. On the left, I've got this bar that's just giving me other things like the recent pages I've been to, anything I've starred, which is the same as bookmarking. I always encourage folks to star important things, your PTO policy, a space can be starred. So if I'm constantly working with a certain team, I'll just star their space to get to it and individual pages. This section has all the spaces that I've recently either been to or starred. In this example, I, again, my naming convention is terrible. I have a personal space, which is my name, Robert Heen, and then I have another space called Heen.tech, and I decided those were important, so I starred them. I can unstar them just by clicking on the star, and when it's colored in, it's been bookmarked. The recent menu is one of the places I like the most. Again, it's keeping track of where I've been and when. I don't know, honestly, off the top of my head, don't know how far back it goes, but I'm going here a lot because I'm bouncing around between so many different spaces. My particular job has me going from team to team to team. Hopefully many folks get to work in one space and get a bit more comfortable with it, but even then this will track it all. Right from here, I can edit the page or I can star it. So I don't even have to open the page if I need to go edit or open it, I can just click on it, but I could just star some favorites right from here. Worked on is, again, the one that I'm always embarrassed by a little bit because there'll just be half-built pages in here that I went, whoops, I should go fix that. Created by me is similar. Again, all the pages I happen to have created. And one thing that I didn't notice for a while are these nice little words on the side here, draft, meaning I've never published the page, only pretty much I can see it, and then unpublished changes. Uh, again, really bad, I'll draft up a whole page and then not hit save. And then people complain, why is it out of date? Whoops, Rob forgot to hit go. Confluence is gonna remind me, hey, this page has unpublished stuff, go check it out. I have a list of all my starred pages. Again, some folks have a lot of starred pages and that works for them. I try to keep this list pretty short just so I don't have to scroll too much, really only the important stuff. Yeah, but again, from here I can star or unstar if I need to clean it up pretty easy. And then my favorite slash not favorite, my list of drafts. I have a lot more of these in my work environment, but where have I gone and made a page and never finished it? The next menu, just going across the top here, are spaces. And we can see here, Andrew has a personal space in this Confluence instance that I visited. Confluence remembered that. Maybe I want to go there again. And then I've got the two that I'm actually working on. At the bottom, I have a menu item called Create a Space. I'll talk a bit more about this in the admin training, but this is a special permission that I happen to have in this instance. Usually in environments I work in, only a few people can do this. And the reasoning there is we don't want a whole bunch of folks creating space after space after space after space because then things get too cluttered. Again, imagine a library that had a thousand different sections for books. It'd be very hard to find something. So when we think of Confluence and how do we get people to want to use it, we need to consider what spaces will we use. I won't get too deep into that type of discussion. I'm happy to continue it if folks find it interesting, but we wanna be kind of judicious and targeted with the spaces we have, and what is our strategy for creating new ones and maintaining the ones that we have. The Teams menu will show any teams that we have. Again, I could make a team just for my engineering group. I could have a team just of my specialists in QA, as many teams as I need. I worked in an environment once that had synchronized their confluence to uh, Active Directory in Microsoft, so every manager had a team, and every manager's manager, so it was very easy to include, oh, everyone who reports up to Sally should get this page. Usually I don't have that luxury, so I have to go through and either make a new one or at mention individuals, 
But teams are another pretty powerful way to share and control information without having to keep a list and copy and paste it. I won't talk too much about apps, but this is like your app store on your phone. Confluence has Confluence and Elastic have a big marketplace where third-party developers build extensions and other things. So your Confluence environment may look a little bit different than mine. This is a pretty much vanilla environment with a couple, you know, it's premium, I think, on the subscription level. So you may go to your Confluence and have extra macros or additional templates or things you didn't see here. And it's likely because your company happens to have apps. Some apps are great. Personally, I don't know which ones I've used in the past. I you know, didn't think to ask, um, but you can check these out by finding new apps and just exploring. And it's up to your IT team or whoever manages it to figure out how do you get them if they look good. This last menu is templates. I'll touch back on this in a minute when we start creating content, but I can click this and see all of the templates in this particular space. Um, this button here, I personally don't like. It does say create, it's really inviting. I don't like it because folks are confused about what happens after they push it. Yes, you'll create a page, but where does it go? It goes wherever you happen to be browsing. So if I hit that button right now, it goes at the top of my space. So what that will look like, I'll pop over to a space real quick. Now I've opened up Heen Tech, and I always open up the wrong one in these trainings. But if I hit this Create button right now, I'll have another page showing up right here. It won't be a child of any page. It won't be nested. And this can be confusing for folks. Again, imagine your people team, human resources team. They have this great page tree that's very organized. And all of a sudden, there's like, you know, policy for vacation in England just shows up at the bottom. People don't know how it got there. It takes a while to figure out. And that's because someone pushed that create button sitting on this page. So please feel free to click it. It's very useful. It's on almost every page in Confluence. But be aware that whichever page you have open, it's going to be made a child of that page inserted underneath it. You can also create other pieces of content with it. I always pick on a page because that's the thing I happen to have used the most. Uh, but we can see I could make a blog from here. Um, quick show of hands, who's used whiteboards in Confluence? And I'll be honest, I only started like a week ago. Um, I've been finding them very useful for getting the content in Confluence. Otherwise, I'm using Lucidchart. And say I build out a troubleshooting document for my support team. If they don't have access to Lucidchart, I have to copy the chart, paste it into Confluence, and then I have to go update it twice. If instead I do that as a Confluence whiteboard, it's just in Confluence. So when I think of my content, and this is a, a, you know, a bigger topic of content strategy, I want as much as I can in here or directly link to it so the teams that use it don't have to go somewhere else. I want to reduce the friction, reduce the distance. Databases are another new one that I'm tinkering with. Um, I'll be honest, I use Notion for this similar thing because they already have that particular feature. Um, but I am working on figuring out databases. It's a way to include multiple pieces of information on one Confluence page. Um, Kurt, I think you were using them instead of like a static table. It gives you more sorting options and you can link content in different areas. So I'm still exploring that. That is in beta. So again, you see it here because I agree to it as the Confluence admin. Um, so you may or may not have that at work. I'm going to just change spaces. And again, I'll click on spaces and go to the space I meant to go to, um, which is my personal space in this particular instance. And you'll notice that all the menus kind of changed up a little. I've still got the home, recent space, templates, et cetera, across the top. But everything on the left here now looks a bit different. And so this is my navigation bar within the space. And this is one thing the space admin can do to help clean things up, is just get rid of these that aren't needed. For example, if I don't need the Confluence calendar, my space admin can click a rocker and make it disappear. And we'll chat about that in the space admin section. But that's you know space on the screen that's fairly prominent that users will be staring at going, why is that there? Or if we're really unlucky, they'll start using that feature and no one else will know what's going on. And so suddenly your updates don't appear where you expect and they're off in some blog somewhere. I worked at a company that used the question and answer the QA feature in Confluence. And People were confused. Do I go to that to get help? Do I go to Slack? Do I go to somewhere else? And so we ended up with questions coming in from employees in like five different places, and no one was managing them. So we want to be careful about the features we expose to folks, because if they're there, they'll get used. <laughs> um, space settings, again, I'm a space administrator. That's a special role. I see that. If you're not a space admin, you don't see that. So if you're wondering why can't I change things about the space, it's because you don't have that particular permission. Next up is shortcuts. And this is another one that uh, kind of 
My dad calls them blinding flashes of the obvious or BFOs. Once I figured out what it was, it made a lot of sense. And I was like, why haven't I been using this? But you can add a hyperlink to any piece of content. And it shows up right on the, on the space. So this could be another page in Confluence, something you think your team needs all the time. Maybe it's a weekly stand-up document. Maybe it's an important policy. Or it could be a link outside of Confluence. This particular one goes to my blog, but imagine you have a Tableau dashboard you need people to check regularly or some other system they have to go log into. You don't have to bury it in a page as a hyperlink. It could just be a shortcut. And to create those, I just push plus and I either paste in the link that I need or I can find the Confluence page. And then at the bottom left, I've got my content. These are all of my pages. This is what most people think of when they think of what's in Confluence. It's pages in this hierarchical <laughs> uh, content tree. This is something that, as I think through how do we use Confluence, I always consider how is it arranged? Now, I was telling Andrew before this, I spent about a month working with a recruiting team to reorganize what will their tree look like? What parent pages will they have? What will roll up under what? Because when someone brand new to your team joins, they're gonna look at this and this will be their first exposure to that information. So we want it to make some sense, at least be able to explain why these pages go up to those pages or why this page is over there. Because here, someone's interested in Confluence Basics, they can just push this little carrot and start expanding and digging and exploring. I forget the limit to how deep these page trees can go. I wanna say it's 100. Please don't go that deep. <laughs> the recommendation is like four to five max. Anything beyond that, and it gets a little bit murky. Also, anything beyond that, and I would challenge you to really think, is this the right place to put that content, or can I pull it up a level or two? To access a page, I just click on it, and then it opens. Now, I mentioned access, and I'll touch on it again. If I don't have access to view a page, it just doesn't show up. So it's possible but highly unlikely that someone added a page to my personal space and chose to exclude me from it. Now there's ways around that. I could go to a Confluence admin and have them essentially break into the page. And I've had to do that when folks lock the page and then leave the company, whoops. Uh, but that should be few and far between. When we open the page, you'll notice it changes again. Uh, does anyone know the recent UI update they pushed out that changed how this looks? <laughs> Does anyone notice a difference? This is a very kind of like, not a deep cut kind of thing. Before your page tree would vanish when you were editing and your top menu would also go away. So I opened up Confluence one day, I didn't see the update and I was like, wait, wait, this looks just a little bit different. <laughs> so the nice people at Alaskan are constantly going through and trying to figure out the best way to show stuff. So if you think something's different, I'll show you in the community, you can go look up what are the recent updates because I tend to miss those. They go into my spam, I don't see them. But from time to time, the UI does change, and that can be a little bit frustrating. So I do my best to let my team know. I'll take a screenshot of this and just put an arrow and say, hey, this is now visible when editing. And the five seconds I take to do that, again, helps reduce some of the friction and challenge that folks have using the system. On the page, uh, does anyone know what that yellow bit means? Someone just shout it out. Yeah, there's a where on the page. <laughs> Yeah, behind the yellow thing. So visually, Confluence calls out comments. And again, this is one way to collaborate. It's exactly the same as an at mention in Slack or Google or Teams or any of the other tools. Um, visually, you'll see them. And you can also click on a comment button in the top here in my little toolbar, little comment bubble, and that'll expose them. Again, I do this a lot, and I think it drives some people crazy. But every time I see something incorrect with a page, if I can edit it, I tend to just go in and change it if I know it's correct. You know, I'll double check first, but many times I can't edit the page. I don't have that permission. So instead, I'll just comment. And folks will see stuff like this, and maybe in three months I come back and no one's done anything, but at least I've done my best to let them know, hey, this information is inaccurate and should be updated. So going along the top real quick, we've got the breadcrumbs, and this just shows me where in Confluence I am. I'm in the space robert.heen under Confluence Basics, under creating a page. I've got my edit pencil, if you don't see this, you just don't have access to edit the page. So that would be go find your space admin and ask them, hey, can you give me access, please? My comments, automations are fairly new. And curious show of hands, who uses Confluence automations? Okay, I've been, I've been tinkering with one that will summarize meeting notes. And the first time it triggered, it sent me a blank email. 
um, I kept trying and I've started to get an email that summarizes what's going on. So there's some interesting things in there. Right now I'm tinkering more with the auto archiving, which I'll talk about more as a space admin. But when I think of Confluence, again, it's a library, they take books out of circulation. The book is old, the book is damaged, there's something wrong with it, take it out, get a new one. So we also wanna consider in Confluence, when do we get rid of things? And I'll talk a little bit about archival and deletion in a moment. Um, back to my page, I can start it, and I can watch it. Does anyone use watching? Oh, a couple, awesome. Um, I'm constantly reminding my team that this feature exists, please use it, because if you watch a page, you'll get an email update when it changes. So for example, my company PTO policy, I watch just in case they decide to change when I can take PTO. <laughs> Other pages I'll watch though are like daily, like a stand-up document. So the way one of my teams does it is they go by sprint. So in Agile, you'll have a two or three or four week period of work and they have a meeting every few days of the week. They'll have one big document. I just watch it. And then I get an email saying, hey, there's been updates. Your team is doing something new. I'm really lazy. So if I can have the system just tell me, hey, go check this out, that's what I'm gonna do. You can also watch the whole space. Ugh, risky. <laughs> um, you'll get a lot of emails this way. But if you're comfortable controlling that, or if it's a small space, maybe one that you own and you let other people edit, you might wanna watch it just to make sure you know what's going on. Uh, curious how much folks are using AL, or is it AI? I always forget. Um, Atlassian Intelligence came out late last year, early this year, I forget exactly when. Is anyone using it in Confluence? Okay, I know we're standing in a Confluence office with a Confluence employee in the back, so we might be a little bit reluctant. <laughs> um, honestly, I've been using it a little bit. The biggest use case I have is the natural language search. And the reason that's such a good use case for me is many of our Confluence instances are big, and someone types in policy, and the first thing they get is, you know, PTO policy in Bulgaria. Well, I'm not in Bulgaria, that doesn't help me, and they gotta scroll and scroll and scroll, and they give up and they think the search is useless. It's not useless, it's just structured in a way that is maybe not conducive. That little summarize or that little natural language search can be really helpful. What is the PTO policy in the USA? Might find the page. And again, it's all about getting people to the stuff they need and this extra tool helps us get there. Uh, what does an open red lock mean on a page? There's permissions, but you can see them. I didn't plant Kurt, I promise. <laughs> Some people can view and edit, no? There's no restriction on the page, no? It's an open red lock, sorry. So an open gray lock, no restrictions, everyone can view and edit, if you have access to the space. A closed gray lock, Actually, I don't see that one very much, so I'll skip, skip ahead to the one I do know. A closed red lock, only certain people can view and edit. I tend to go all or nothing. I tend to say, hey, if you can get in here, you can edit it, and you know, we can go back through version history and fix it if you make a mistake. Or I lock it down entirely and only let two or three people see it and edit it with me. Now, I tend to only do that when I have something new I'm working on or some super sensitive thing, because in general, Confluence to me is an open space. It's intended to be collaborative. Folks are intended to see information. Of course, there will be some things that maybe some groups or people shouldn't see, and that is okay. But in general, I wanna be permissive and share stuff. The open red lock, whoops, doo -doo 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 -doo, tells me that there are restrictions from the parent. This is something that drives people insane. If the parent of this page is restricted in some way, the child will also be restricted. And this is one of the big sources of frustration. Someone will say, Rob, why can't Jimmy see this page? I go, well, it's restricted. And they say, no, it's not, because they open this up and they don't see any names. Well, you've got to click this link to see the parent, and then it will open the parent for you and it'll show you what's going on on the parent. Oh, closed red lock. Only Robert Heen can edit this and no one can see it. So that little lock icon's super important and again, massive source of frustration. Remember, in, uh, permissions inherit down the tree. So if you want to lock a whole branch of the tree off, just lock the parent and it goes all the way down. Um, I can copy the link. Again, this is the main way I share pages. I don't click this icon though, and I probably really should because it's much easier than what I do, which is select the whole URL, hit Command C, and then paste it in an email. Um, actually looking at the C button on my keyboard, it's kind of worn out because I use it so much. You can also hit Share. 
And this is that other way to share content. This is what lets you share it with a group. So if you have a group set up, everyone in the Dallas office, you could just type in Dallas office or whatever the name of it is. And then everyone would get an email once you share with a link to this thing and then a comment about it. So honestly, this is probably the better way to share because you can include context. If I just send you a random hyperlink, you have to look at the URL and guess at what it is, then click it and follow it. But if you get an email saying, hey, Rob, check this out. This is important for the upcoming work we're doing. Oh, a little bit more useful. This will also warn you, hey, there's page restrictions. So a nice visual reminder that if you send this, folks might not be able to view it because they're locked out. <sighs> OK. Editing. I'll just click my pencil. Again, the page looks very, very similar. The biggest change is I now have, again, I really should figure out what the actual technical name for this is, but the place where all the edit functions are. <laughs> I'll call it the editing palette for today, unless anyone knows the name. Text editor, toolbar. I'll go with toolbar. That sounds intelligent. Thank you. <laughs> um, a lot of similar features. There's one thing that drives me absolutely nuts, or at least did for a while. I can't do font size. I'd love to talk, you know, I'd love to understand more about that. Why was that design decision made? But it kind of makes sense. When we think of Confluence, it's going to look fairly uniform. You know, we don't necessarily want text popping up or out of size. It's, again, information I need to read and get through. So I have these header levels. Now, there's a couple special things that headers let us do. And pop quiz for the audience, but what are some of them? Direct links, yeah. I'll demonstrate this in a minute. You can directly link to a header on a page. So imagine you have a page that you know is 10 feet long. If you put headers in, you can then hyperlink directly to the middle of the page. I use that all the time. I make FAQ documents, and I use header size four for the question, and the answer's right under it. Hey, Rob, how do I log into the system? Cl you know, click on the link for the header, give it to them, and they go right to that question. So links is one. What, are there any more? Table of contents, oh yes. Has anyone used the table of contents macro to automatically make a table of contents? Has anyone struggled with trying to make a table of contents by pasting hyperlinks in? <laughs> That's how I did it at first, it's horrible. Um, headers interact with macros, and macros are just an extension to the page. I'll demonstrate that in just a minute. Anything else headers can do? It's, they're actually doing it right now. They're visually breaking up the page. There's a joke, like the wall of text. Imagine a document that's just all bleh, you know, text size. It's hard for my brain to read that. I can. I might have to like put my finger on it. So instead, when we build content, we should consider where are our headers. I tend to have one at the top, background. What is this page for? And then I might have a table of contents. And then I have other headers based on what's in the page. So very quickly, if I want to add a table of contents to this, we can see there's some stuff in here, some Jira stuff some wonderful lorem ipsum that I spend hours writing. Maybe I want a table of contents. One way I could do this would be to copy links to all the headers. Those would be static, they'd never change. Instead, I'm gonna be super lazy and click on this plus. You can also do a forward slash to get the same menu. And I'm gonna search for table, I'm gonna spell it correctly, table of contents. And then Confluence will just build the table of contents for me. And you'll notice there's an indent and that's telling me I have a header one, and then I have a header two under it, and then another header one. So visually, this will build your TOC, your table of contents, based on the header size you select of the text. I use this on almost all my pages, even if they're short, just so when folks get there, they can skip straight to the how-to, skip straight to the policy, skip straight to the update, whatever the stuff is. Now, if I, pub oopsies. If I publish this or update it, that table of contents appears at the top, and it's hyperlinked. I just click on it, I go straight there. And if I mouse over this, I can copy a link right to that header. So if I send this to someone on my team, they don't have to scroll down the page. They'll go straight to where that header is. Again, blinding flash the obvious. Once I knew it, my head kind of blew up when I learned about it. But headers are really good at breaking up visually and then also linking and interacting with things. OK, I'm going to talk for another few minutes, and I'll give us a break because we started a little bit late. Honestly, I could keep going all night with this stuff, but I will stop, I promise. Um, while I'm editing, there is, I don't talk about this much page status. Quick show of hands, has anyone actually used that? Andrew, thank you. <laughs> um, I use it a little bit. I've only ever had one person call me out on, hey, Rob, this page says it's a rough draft. Is it accurate? 
was like, Eric, thank you. You actually read the status. Um, my beef with the status is I can't search by it. <laughs> so I can't go in, say I publish a page. I got past the step of making a draft. Yes, I hit publish. It's not quite done. How do I go find just that rough draft? I can't figure out a way to do that in vanilla Confluence in the basic Confluence yet. That said, if our controls around how we use Confluence and how we all agree to use it are strong enough, this could be very, very useful because you can have your own statuses. You might have in review or ready for publish or ready for consumption or something that helps your team better manage the content. That said, it's challenging at this point because there aren't many built-in automated tools to do that for us. Uh, oh, uh, collaboration links. Can anyone see the change in the URL link from back there that happens when I edit the page? <laughs> and I say that laughing, no, because the text is way too small. <laughs> when you edit a page, yeah, you probably can't see that. The word edit shows up way at the end. Um, if I take this link and I give it to someone else in my organization who has access to the page, they'll be able to edit it with me live. So there are now two Roberts in this document. If you look at the top, you'll see two Robs. But if I click around, the other Rob will see where I, will see where I am at the end of Lorem. So this is one way you can work on a document live together. Before I figured this out, I would publish it and say, hey, Sally, it's your turn. And she would go in and she would do it. And then we go back and forth. This is great. I don't, I, most of my team isn't in San Francisco. So we can work together even if we're in Seattle and LA and San Francisco on the documents live. And all I have to do is edit it and then grab the edit link and share it. Last thing I'll talk about here is search. Um, ooh, ask Al. AI, that's a joke. The uppercase I looks like a lowercase L to me. Um, has anyone been in a company where in the middle of a company, all hands, IT gets called up because no one can find anything in Confluence? <laughs> uh, that happened to me twice. That was exciting. I wasn't you know, called up to talk about it, but they got the CIO on the all hands to explain why Confluence was so challenging to use. And it boiled down to no one was using it in a structured way. Like the symptom everyone had was I can't find what I need. The root cause wasn't Confluence is a bad system. The root cause wasn't bad data is in there. It's, it wasn't structured properly. People were putting pages in spaces that they didn't necessarily align with. People weren't titling pages in a way that really made sense. People weren't doing things like adding you know, keywords or labels or other things that help the search find the thing. Now, again, I briefly mentioned uh, Atlassian Intelligence lets us do natural language searches, which really help with that problem. But most people also didn't know there was a search bar. And so I would go to people's desk, oh, how do you find stuff? And they would click around in spaces and said, well, do you know about the search bar in the top right? And they're like, no. <laughs> it's like, OK, well, maybe we start there and then see what happens. So you can just type in terms. Um, I tend to use the advanced search, which if you're familiar with Jira's advanced search, JQL, it's not quite as powerful, not quite as many options, but I can do things like limit by space, who created or edited it, when was it updated, what type of content is it? If I'm using blog posts and pages, maybe I only want to search in one or the other. Where is the content? Is it under a certain part of a space? Again, if I have a very large space with a lot of stuff, I want to limit my search just where I think something is. And last, I promised I would talk about archived content, but we can take content and confluence and archive it. Again, think back to our library. The librarian doesn't burn it. They don't throw it out necessarily. They put it in a back room in a box. And if someone asks for that exact book, they know it's in the back room in the box, but it's not taking up shelf space. So in confluence, when you archive something, it'll vanish from the page tree, but it's still findable in search. So I'll do this with outdated policies. I'll do this with older how-to articles that are maybe old versions. I don't want to get rid of it. I don't want to delete it. But I also don't want it cluttering up the page because my users will go in there and use Confluence. They can also find it just by clicking Show Archive Content and then Search. Oh, OK, I've done a lot of talking. What questions do you have? Hopefully about Confluence. <laughs> Please. Yeah, so is there a way to sort or order our blog posts by type of event or by, you know, what, what, we, what we did in them? 
Um, what we're seeing here is the blogs page in this space. So we can't directly do what you're asking. It's gonna show me every blog in the space. Now, if this space is just for my engineering team, maybe this includes my standups and I very clearly call them, you know, stand up March 5th. So visually stand up, stand up, stand up. The other thing you could do is add like a label to them. So have a label for all your stand up blog posts and then you could search for blogs with stand up as the label and then you would just get that list. So blogs are displayed chronologically. I don't have many in this example. I should probably cram some more in, but you can see from 2023 or from 2024. Did that get to your question okay? Awesome. All right, what else, team? What else you got? We have this thing, too. It's a microphone. We have to use it. We got to use it. <laughs> Who's up next? I knew I should have planted some more questions with someone. Um, all right, again, I really like blog posts now. I've got my team pretty well trained on, hey, my weekly updates go into the blog. Uh, and they are a great historical way to keep track. Hey, what did we do in 2023? It's all just right here. Um, because there are no questions, I will ask one. Hey, Rob, how do you move content in the page tree? That's a great question, Rob. Let me show you. So in our page tree, when we create the page, it's inserted somewhere in there. We might make a mistake. We might realize we have to reorganize it, and that's totally okay. I can just click and drag and move these around. I can also remove them between branches of the tree. I do this a lot where I accidentally make the page under the wrong parent. I tend to finish my work and then I go back and I just click and drag it out and put it under the appropriate parent. So again, this might be, if you don't have appropriate access, you might not be able to move this stuff around. Most users can. But making sure our page tree is organized is important because our users go in and they expect to see policies under policy, standups under standups. Documentation under documentation. This little ellipsis menu is also where we can delete things. I didn't talk very much about drafts, um, but we can delete drafts. Only I will see the draft until it's published. So again, I'm really bad, even in this demo environment, about publishing my drafts and making them useful. I really should be deleting them. And I imagine there's a way to automate that away. Again, I'm a very lazy person, so if the system can do the work for me, I want it to. The last thing I'll call out before we break, if I click this ellipsis on a published page, you'll see a lot of different options. Archiving is one of them. I have the permission to archive and delete. In most environments I've worked in, only a few people can delete. And only some people can archive. Your environments may be uh, broader. Now, this is what I call a soft delete. It'll sit in a trash in the Confluence space for up to 30 days. So if you make a big whoopsie and you delete, Go find your space admin real fast, and they should be able to salvage it for you. <laughs> but in general, I don't push the delete button unless I'm really, really sure. I tend to archive, and that just removes it from the page tree. Oh. Sorry, I saw two hands there. We'll, we'll get to you. <laughs> um, is there a way that regular users can find out who the space admin is? Andrew, help me out here, man. Andrew, I need your help. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, I will get back to you on that. I feel like there should be, and this is one of those things where I personally haven't had to figure it out, so I don't know. Okay. Um, I are there like the space owner, like who can admin the space? Yeah. So the question was, how do we find the space admin? I honestly tend to go to my IT team. I'll, I'll put in a Jira ticket and say, who is the ad space admin for engineering, and then I go bug them. Yeah. The, the problem is in this particular demo, I'm a super admin everywhere. Hang on, I can go to your space though, Andrew. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm an admin here too. <laughs> uh, tell you what, I, I promise that beginning folks may not have heard this, I will do a full follow up YouTube on every single question, even if it was answered, but I will definitely answer that one because now I want to know. <laughs> Um, can you go over again what automation was on a page? Automation, yes. 
Uh, I'm most familiar with automations on the Jira side of the house. They recently deployed this in Confluence. Uh, bah, 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 bah. It shows up right here. And if I open this up, this is from the space. It's going to show me all the templates. I can create my own rule in the top right. Again, if you're familiar with Jira automations, it'll look similar. And the structure, uh, you know, trigger action condition, their trigger condition action is the same. Individual pages also have this. Uh, not on the overview page, though. Excuse me. I'm just striking out. There we go. As this little lightning bolt looking icon right next to the star. So I don't have any that are active right now, so you don't see anything here. But this is where I would go to create an automation, manage them, or see what has run. Did that get your question? Like, can you give an example of what you would do there? Yeah. Um, what I've started using at work is automating my meeting notes. So when I publish any page that has meeting notes in the title, and that's part of my template title, it will take that, compress it into an email, and then email that to me. Cool. So I get you know a very concise meeting notes. I'm, I'm still tinkering with how much I want to use it. Um, the other one that I really want to start using is automatically archiving or tagging pages that haven't been used in a while. So I've done this manually. I've gone through and looked at pages. Oh, that's stale. Oh, that's old. But the automation can run and instead label the page, potentially stale, you know, get rid of this, or even just archive it and it, it disappears. I'm honestly still exploring uh, useful use cases for me in automations. Um, I'll encourage you, though, pop into Confluence, you know, if you have an instance that has them and just see what their templates are for ideas. And then pop over to the community, which I haven't spoken about at all, um, the Elastian community, and just see what other folks have been using them for. Um, and that's one example of Elastian gave us this tool, Automations and Confluence, with some ideas on how it could work. I just personally haven't seen ones that I'm like, yes, I want that. Earlier, you were saying the page statuses, has, there's no computational way to search for them at the moment. I do see there's an automated uh, um, choice on that previous page you just were on. It yes. says page status has changed. I don't know if that could help you. It, honestly, it probably could. And I think I saw it's a new. <laughs> um, one of the great things and kind of honestly frustrating things is systems we use are constantly being updated. And even at the companies that I work at, I don't know everything that's going on. I log into Confluence and Jira and other systems all the time and see brand new stuff. Um, and that's why I like doing these trainings, because folks like yourself and others call out, hey, Rob, right there on the page is something that answers your question. And I go, oh, yeah. <laughs> Look, it's there now. <laughs> hey, Rob, uh, if there's any other questions. I was just thinking maybe you could, to answer Chris's, pull up the Atlassian training instance because you wouldn't be a space admin in the one that we use for creators, and maybe. Uh, I'm in there right now. This is a creator's demo. No, it's the, uh, the Atlassian, uh, Atlassian training.net, like the one. And if it's, let's see if it comes up in here. If not, that's OK. Not coming up. That's OK. I'll send you a link and then we can maybe look at it. Awesome. After that, yeah. Again, it probably has a solid answer. I'm just unaware of it right now. Thank you. Um, all right. I think I overshot our break by like 15 minutes. Um, I'll talk about what's next later as well. Um, the Atlassian community, community.atlassian.net.com. Lots of loads of people in there much smarter than I am about this stuff. <laughs> Um, lots of great free training opportunities in there, lots of great recorded stuff, lots of great places to ask questions and get answers. Um, I highly recommend if you aren't in there already, go check it out. Um, tons of stuff. Uh, go get hands-on in your instance. I always encourage folks, like if you have a question, how does it blank work, go try it. You probably can't hurt it. Just be careful of like a delete button if you see one. Um, check out my content. I'll have the Q&A coming. All my information is at the bottom. Uh, and talk to other folks about it. Keep attending events like this when you can. Talk internally. How are other teams at your company using it to share ideas and get exposure to different things? Whew. All right. And thus concludes Confluence Basics, which did not cover everything I wanted to cover, even though I got 15 more minutes than I thought I would. Um, 